Okay, the 12-year-old me may have looked at Sukkot and Simchat Torah differently than I would now at 40, right? Um, and the, maybe, maybe I learned it in Hebrew school. Maybe I had no background with Jewish learning. Maybe I had minimal background with Jewish learning. Maybe I had Jewish learning that was less than inspiring, which you find that happens. Um, and sometimes we get stunted and we, get, we stay in that spot and we, we're very comfortable re-examining how we look at communication or how we look at racism or how we look at gender roles. We're very comfortable re -exam even if it's uncomfortable, we're comfortable with the idea of re-examining those, but sometimes we're less than comfortable re-examining how we perceive and understand ritual and tradition because we get in this space and that's where we stay. So hopefully today, um, one of my passions is, and which is why I will revisit this annually, right? Because if Sukkot shows up on the calendar every single year, then I have to show up and be ready to learn what does it mean this year for me? What does it mean for where I'm holding in life? What does it mean for the, where the world's holding or for I'm holding my personal life and then my familial life or my micro, the microcosm of, of what's going on in, in the world. So um, hopefully that's what we'll be able to do today. Um, and that's why I usually start with the Kabbalah of the holiday series, usually um, to be able to really re-examine things through the adult lens. Like I say always, you know, like we would never be satisfied with a psychologist who stopped learning after they got out of medical school, right? You'd always want them to be continuing learning. Sarah, I, and you're a role model for that, right? Continue learning, continue educating, continue connecting and understanding new philosophies, new theories, etc. So, but with Judaism, sometimes we stagnate. So if Sukkot shows up every year, it's showing up for a reason. And if we're meant to walk away from Sukkot with certain tangible takeaways and certain transformational ideas, then there's a reason we're, we're at that point in the calendar. So today we're going to explore Sukkot. So I want to share with you something interesting that happened. So the Sukkot at Chabad is up. Oh, hold on a second. I'm going to unmute you. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm going to unmute you. There was some crunching now. No, wait, go ahead. Okay, yeah, I just want to say I'm going to turn off the video because this is when I have to prepare lunch, so Enjoy it'll be distracting, lunch, but us, I'm listening. You know I'm what listening. I'm saying, none of us are going to mind, and we, uh, you, know, the, you know that's when we forget. Enjoy it. <laughs> okay, but I'm, I am listening. I'm no just worries. Enjoy, the video. Enjoy lunch. Okay. okay. So yesterday, just to start with this interesting perspective. So yesterday, there is a police like car or SUV that like drives by Chabad pretty slowly. So Label's sitting outside in the couch, he's 15, and he sees the cop and he waves. I noticed the cop waved back, so I didn't see Label wave, so I waved. Now suddenly the cop makes a U-turn and it comes right into Chabad. What happened was he was worried because one person waved him down, the other person waved him down. Now he pulled up and he's like, hey, are you guys okay? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're fine. Why? He's like, oh, you both waved. I didn't even realize Label had waved to say hi. I just saw the cop wave, so I waved back. So um, I said, yeah, no, we're totally fine. He, I said, oh, we just, I guess we were raised to appreciate law enforcement and appreciate what you do and appreciate the fact that you keep us safe. And I guess my son was saying hi. I saw you say hi. I was saying hi. Just, we appreciate you. Thank you. He's like, he was a little taken. He's like, oh, okay. Full surprise. And um, leaves, leaves the Chabad parking lot and about five minutes circles right back around. He's like, can I ask you a, a question? I'm like, yeah. He's like, you won't be offended. I'm like, why would I be offended? He's like, what is this thing? And he points to the sukkah. I was like, well, it's a sukkah. He's like, no, no, I see it says sukkah, but like what and why and, and, and give me the lowdown. You don't mind, right? And of course, we never mind, right? Knowledge is power. So first of all, I thanked him for asking. Um, I thanked him again for what he does for us as a local police officer, make sure our neighborhoods are safe. Um, and then I went on to give him a very brief overview of what a sukkah is, what it represents, why we sit in it, why we eat in it, and what are the practical takeaways that we're meant to walk away from Sukkot or from sitting in a sukkah, eating in a sukkah, what are we supposed to walk away with? So I started off by explaining to him that everything that we do as Jews has historical context. So if the, in 2020 we're sitting and eating in a sukkah, there is something that happened in history, in, in our past, that is pulling us to this time and place where we're sitting in a sukkah and we're eating in it. We're either commemorating something, we're remembering something, we're marking something. So he's like, okay, cool. So what is Sukkot really about? I'm going to now not give you the five minute 
curbside police officer version. I'm going to give you a little bit of a broader zoomed in version, but then I'll circle around and conclude with the curbside version because it will wrap it all up really nicely together. So what happens is any stop on the Jewish calendar, we talked about this in the past, any stop on the Jewish calendar is inherently, um, a, like we said, it's not past, present, and future. It's a, there's a Jewish calendar, it's like a spiral, and we tug or we, we drop on the historical spot where something happened to us, and there's a certain energy on that day, and we draw that energy inward into our life. So what is it we're commemorating with Asura? So most importantly, we need to understand that the rituals and mitzvot of Sukkot are there to be transformational. And so Sukkot itself, we know, is has like three names. Number one, it's Chag HaSukkot, which means the festival, fest, sorry, festival of booths. Okay, a Sukkot is a temporary dwelling place, meant to be temporary, meant to be that we see the stars, meant to be that it's a transient, um, you're not meant to be, it's not meant to be a permanent structure. Number one. Number two, Chag HaAsif. Now, Chag HaAsif, literally, all the Jewish holidays have a agricultural parallel or a parallel in the agricultural journey. And we're commemorating and marking those um, moments on the calendar that are related to the agricultural reality in, this, in Israel, and the Jewish people in the time that they lived in Israel. So HaAsif means to gather. It's a harvest festival. Okay, they were gathering their fruits and their things, the end of the crop, beginning of winter, right? Fall time, we all can understand that. And then comes Zman Simchatenu, which literally means the time of rejoicing. Now, interestingly enough, it is the only holiday that it biblically is a command, a mitzvah, to be joyous. It says that, V'samachta v'chagacha v'hayita achsameach. You shall be joy, v'samachta from the word simcha, you should be, have joy on your b'chagecha with your holiday, the hayita, and you should be ach samer, only happy. Okay, interesting. What's this happiness? What does it have to do with historical context? What does it have to do with me? And as I said before, the holidays and the rituals are tra potentially transformational. How do I make that transition from a slogan of um, be joyous, to like actually affecting joy in my day-to-day -day life. And interestingly enough is earlier when it came to Rosh Hashanah, we discussed how we tend to look at the Jewish holidays. Here's Rosh Hashanah, here's Yom Kippur, here's Sukkot, here's Yom Torah, each a se separate little bubble or island. And really there's actually, Hasidus and Kabbalah will explain, there's a really beautiful flow between Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Yom Torah that when you zoom out and you understand the connectivity, you can really, really walk away from those holidays with real, practical, incredible tools, okay? Because Judaism is meant to be real and personal and practical and relatable and for humans. Judaism is for you. So it says, Torah it's not in the heavens, okay? It's for humans, okay? So what is that? So let's start with the most famous knowledge of Sukkot, because Sukkot is called Sukkot. Yes, it's Manchas, it's Manchasen. Yes, it's Chaga Asif. Absolutely, all of those. But it's most popularly, widely known as Sukkot. So what is, what are we commemorating and marking historically? So historically, Sukkah refers to a temporary dwelling place. And it actually, the command is to commemorate the fact that while the Jews were traversing or traveling through the desert, God created a hug for them. Protection from the elements, from the scorpions, from the enemies, from the sun, from the sandy desert, Cla described as the Anane Hakavo, the clouds of glory. Think of it as a thick fog that's enveloping you. And the Jewish people were protected while they traveled with this Anane Hakavo, this clouds of glory. And it, it was literally a defense mechanism. And it was against the elements, against everything. And whatever their needs were, it was there as a reliable way of Hashem showing, I'm here with you, I'm traveling with you, I'm going through life with you, the ups and downs of the desert years. We know if you study the book of Deuteronomy or Bamidbar, there is numbers you will see that was quite an up and down journey. And the Ananiah covered were a constant. So the uh, clouds of glory, so to commemorate and to thank Hashem, we're saying thank you. In essence, it's a Thanksgiving holiday. We're saying, thank you, Hashem, for protecting us 
from that which could have damaged us in our journey in the desert. Now, why then is it not celebrated in Passover time when we left Egypt? Or why is it not celebrated at a different time even? And so it's celebrated specifically in the fall when we know the weather is unpredictable. Now, it happened to be Yom Kippur. It described the weather as it was supposed to rain the entire Monday, Yom Kippur. And we were really unsure how we're going to do the services outdoors in the rain. Our luck, and I won't call it luck, I would say divine intervention, Hashem pulled some sort of strings that it was really breezy and beautiful at night. And while everyone went to sleep, whatever needed to come down from heavens came down from heavens. And we woke up Monday morning, Yom Kippur morning, and there was a little rain on the chairs, but it was beautiful. The weather was magnificent. But we all know fall weather is not predictable. You wake up in the morning, you need a sweater. Later in the day, you know, even alpha-wise sweater weather, but sweater weather in Texas we know is for an hour in the morning and an hour at night, and the rest of the day you need to be in a, I don't know, tank top. Maybe I'm not wearing a tank top, but you need to be in lighter clothing, okay? So the weather fluctuates. It's not constant, consistent, and stable. So when we're saying thank you, Hashem, for giving me an opportunity or for protecting us, we go out into the uncertain weather and we say, Hashem, I know you've taken care of me and I want to thank you for it. Not when it's the most stable or the most ideal, not in May when it's early spring, specifically when the weather may be uncertain. In the Northeast, the days were hot, we needed sweaters, we sometimes even coats, sometimes it poured. And we're saying that you took care of us when it was unstable, we weren't sure, and we want to show our thanks specifically in that, in that arena where it's unstable and unsure. Now, what does this sukkah represent? So it represents unity, it represents a hug, and we'll explain how it represents unity. So now when it comes to sukkah, and it comes to the laws of building a sukkah, there are whole tractates in the Mishnah and in the Talmud that deal with all sorts of nuances. I remember when my son was learning it, all my children, they start off in the beginning of learning Mishnayas, um, they start off with learning uh, the how the uh, sukkah, the section of construction of a sukkah, because it's interesting to kids. Can I build a sukkah on the top, back of an elephant, on a camel, in a tree house? Can I build a sukkah out of, you know, metal? Can I build a sukkah? All sorts of details. How tall can it be from the top to the bottom? How, how high can it be? How... So there's so many fascinating specifications. However, the one area where there's zero specifications is how large a sukkah could be. What material it's made out of, who, how, where, it's, where it's located, all the details, if I show you slides of Masech the Sukkah, absolutely fascinating. Like truly, truly, truly fascinating to see the different variables in how a sukkah can be constructed. However, and actually, um, there is usually in Israel, over Sukkot, there is a museum or park that does like a, that does a, um, a exhibit of different types of Sukkot according to this tractate in, um, according to this tractate in Mishnah, it shows you all the different types. I'm gonna show you, it's so interesting. Here we go. I'm gonna share with you um, some of it because you can see, I'm gonna just share a screen. It's so fascinating to see. Hold on a second, we have share screen, I have it up. Here we go, there we go. Okay, so here you see, this is the, the, a sukkah that is higher than 20 cubits. So now it's showing you Oh, here it goes. Neot Kidumim Biblical Park is the only sukkah exhibit, and it talks about 50 different types of sukkot, and we invite you to stroll through them. Okay, so we're not showing through them, but 20, 50 different sukkot types. Can you build it like this? What about on top of a camel? What about on a boat? Now, all of these are not ones you and I have thought about necessarily, right? But it's so cool. Can I have a sukkah that's in the middle of the line? Can I have one that's two stories? And if you look on the bottom, you see where it says Mishnah Sukkah 1, 2, right there? That's where it would be in the Mishnah of Masech the Sukkot. Can um, you have a two-story Sukkah? I don't think so. I am not sure. I, I didn't study Masech the Sukkah. <laughs> I didn't know. I'll ask Levy. We could get him here. If I had him here, I would like schlep him in for this. Um, Treehouse Sukkah. Well, I, I guess the top would count, but the bottom would well, I don't know, because it has to also be a certain amount from the actual ground. 
Okay. I'm just showing you these different ones because it's fascinating. Okay. Here's a bunch of them. Anyone who wants to, you know, look further, feel free, but it is a very interesting. But what's the one area that it, there is no limitation is how big it can be. And as a matter of fact, in the Talmud, it describes the time of Mashiach that all Yisrael, everyone, Yeshvu B'Sukkah Achas, will all sit together in one giant sukkah. That's how it describes Sukkot. The unity. So here comes another fascinating theme. So number one, we're thanking Hashem for his, the fact that he commemorates the fact that he protected us. Number two, we're saying, we realize that everything in life we have comes from somewhere and it's temporary. So we leave our home, we leave our fancy cars, we leave our fancy homes, even if they're not fancy, we leave all our stuff behind and we kind of dwell in the sukkah. We move out of our comfort stuff, we go into the temporary and we're reminding ourselves how temporary life is and how we should not be defining ourselves by our stuff. How often do we just define ourselves by our stuff? We gotta move that away. We gotta move past that. Sukkot is an exercise in doing so. Remember, temporary traveling time, go to a temporary place. Everyone, a sukkah have room for everyone. A sukkah should be open to everyone. There's actually somebody who created an app called like Sukkah on the Corner where basically all over the world, you could find sukkot that are registered that anyone can come in and use the sukkah at any time. Because you want to, now obviously during COVID, I think it's probably a little different. Um, Everything's a little different, but uh, a sukkah is a safe place to be because it's outdoors. So if anyone wants to reserve a time slot in the Chabad sukkah, you're more than welcome, okay? Why is it able to be so? So another theme of Sukkot is unity. Unity between Hashem and us, because we just went through this Rosh Hashanah exercise of acknowledging Hashem's relationship with us, acknowledging the mistakes we've made and moving past that. We just went through forgiveness, damaging the relationship and getting forgiveness. Now we're reunited. Our relationship is stronger. So there's that one theme of unity between us and Hashem. And then there's this unity between us and fellow man. And that leads me to the second mitzvah of Sukkot is the four kinds. Now, the four kinds are a fascinating layer to mitzvah. What are the four kinds? So it actually says biblically um, that you should take for yourself pre eight hadar, the beautiful you know, tree, fruit, um, fruit, uh, the four kinds. I'm gonna pull up a picture so everyone can see. Um, images, hold on, four kinds. Nope, it's pulling up a movie. That's definitely not what I wanna, hold on, let's just pull this up. Lulav, now we've seen this. Why does Hashem want us to pull out or to get a large, beautiful fruits, vegetables. Like what is this vegetation? What is this obsession? Why does God care? Why would the Torah spend time um, showing us? Hold on a second. No, I don't want to join your newsletter. Ah, sorry, lady. Here we go. Here's a good picture. There you go. What are the, apparently you can buy the four kinds on Amazon. Ladies, we have arrived at new times. You can Amazon Prime yourself. No, no Prime. You, you can Amazon order a lulav and etrog. Who knew? What are the lulavs? So the lulav is a palm front. The etrog is a citron. The hadassim are beautiful um, myrtle. And the aravot are willow. Okay, do you see them? Trying to find a bigger picture, it's not really working. You see those? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We see, okay. I see it. Fine. Okay. So, what's the deal with this? If I said the theme of Sukkot was joy in the beginning, and I also said it's unity, how does that unity be, how is that unity expressed in this mitzvah? It seems like an interesting thing. You take all four, none can be missing. If you have one, it's if you're missing one of the four kinds, you're not accomplishing the goal of shaking the lulav and etrog, the adasim and arahot, okay? And they each represent different elements of types of humans, which we'll talk about soon, and actually parts of our body. We'll talk about both of those soon. 
we specifically bring them together, we gather them together, we make a bracha, because it's a mitzvah, so you actually say a bracha every day, except Shabbat and Shabbat. You don't use the little of an etrog and um, hadas and aravot, but you gather them together and you make a bracha, and it is a mitzvah. So let me just shut my share screen. One second. Okay. By the way, very funny on Amazon, just now on my screen that I pulled up, which is so funny that they sell it on Amazon, it showed that there's going to be a massive price drop on this item next week. That was actually really funny. On the, pop, on the side came a little grid, that, a pop-up that said, you know, price will drop next week. Of course the price will drop next week. Who's going to need a little vetro because that's our vote in two weeks, right? Um, so we gather those four kinds together. Now, what do they represent? So first of all, it's a biblical command. So it's a mitzvah. The mitzvah Hashem said to do it. Now, with every mitzvah comes a reminder of something, comes a practical takeaway into our life. So we said that, first of all, a sukkah's conscious reminder is about the thanks, being thankful to Hashem and what he gives us in life, to God for the blessings we have in our life. We said that it's a reminder to us about kind of leaving materialism behind and recognizing how life is temporary and we travel through life in a temporary manner and that we're not defined by our stuff, our home, our cars, etc. We also said another theme was unity. We said you could build all different types of Sukkot, but you have to have that unity. Oh, one more thing I wanted to show you, which I apologize for not showing you before, and we'll get back to Lil Vanetra. I, I really want to just have a chance to show this to you, and I'm sorry for not doing that. So what I want to show you is, guys, you'll see, ladies, you'll see that I got a little better with, I got a little better with Zoom because I've been teaching more on Zoom. So here is, remember I always say I wish I had a pen or whatever? Well, now I do. So here is the word sukkah. So they actually described what makes a sukkah a sukkah. So here's how you write the word sukkah in Hebrew. And actually it says that that is a reminder to us of how you need to build a sukkah. What makes a sukkah a kosher sukkah? So how do we know this from the word sukkah? I'm gonna pull out some. It basically describes, hold on, let's see how I do this. Okay, either a sukkah has to have four walls. Hold on a second, someone's in the waiting room. It's allowing. Okay. Either a sukkah has to have four walls. One, two. Oops. Last one. What? Either. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Good. Hi, guys. Good. 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 It's good to see you. Thank you. You too. Okay. So late. <laughs> yeah, we're at the holiday sukkot, and we're looking at the word sukkah and showing how actually just it describes us how a sukkah should be built. So either it has to have four walls. One, two, three, four. Okay. Or it has to have three walls. One, two, three. Or it has to have two and a half. A sukkah needs to, this is what makes a kosher sukkah. Now, if I have a backyard and I have two walls, I can add a half a third wall and it's a kosher sukkah. It has to have walls that are sturdy enough that they're, they're not supposed to be permanent, remember? They're sturdy enough that they're not going to fly around. And it has to have a top of natural, some sort of natural green material. So here in Texas, in New York, we always had, um, always had, uh, you know, uh, pine needles or some sort of evergreen. The stuff always smelled delicious. In the rain, the pine, you know, the pine, the pine leaves were falling into your soup. There's nothing like a little chicken soup with some extra pine flavor. <laughs> it's always a fun suco flair and vibe. And um, here in Texas, we actually use bamboo mats. And we use, um, on top of that, palm fronds, open giant palm fronds. So something like this, but larger, yeah. and, okay? My boys are actually driving to Houston to pick up the palm for the top of the sukkah. It's gonna be harvested yesterday, and they're picking it up today. They're going with a U-Haul truck, and it becomes a big family, no, not family, but it comes it becomes a journey to pick up the sukkah stuff. Okay, so this is a little bit about the structure of a sukkah. Now going back. Um, Sharon, to catch you up in 30 seconds or less, um, we'll do that. So this is how a sukkah should be constructed. Natural material on top. Interestingly enough, you don't want to have uh, metal on the top. So even if you let's say have a pergola that has metal, you would want to put something in between the metal and the, and the fronds. So maybe a piece of wood or something. So it's supposed to be wood on the top, growing from the ground on the top. And the sides can be metal if you need to be. But again, we said it's supposed to be temporary. So even if you, also, you have a, a pergola up, which guys, late not guys, ladies, um, I will update you that very exciting the pergola for Chabad is going up today. I know. Well, that big fundraising campaign 
we got the pergola. We had the first one quote wanted 80,000, the other one 40,000. We got someone, you know, you're about to pass out, Jared, don't pass out. Um, I could not stomach spending 80,000 on an outdoor pergola. Mm. Yeah, and the second one was 40,000. You got someone to do it for less. So thank God. That being said, yes, that being said, even though the metal is going to be permanent and the wood is going to be on top that's permanent, the yeah. walls will be temporary because it's yeah. something meant to be temporary. So I'm just putting that out there. The frame can be permanent, but the walls are meant to be temporary. Okay. So now I'm stopped sharing that. I'm doing that. We're going back to, I promise, Lulav Etro Kadasim on our remote. Um, Sharon, I did record this, so anything I can forward to you and you can catch up. We're about the halfway mark. So okay. Catch it, okay? Thank you. Baruch Adonai Lehenu Malach Lom Shachal Nei Bedvar. Okay. Now comes, um, so Sharon, to catch you up. Number one, we said Sukkot, it comes up for Shani Yom Kippur because um, it's connected. We talked about there's a historical, um, there's a historical reason for celebrating aside from the biblical command. We're commemorating the fact that God protected us with the clouds of glory. It's a reminder of Hashem's involvement in our life. It's specifically a, a temporary dwelling place because we want to leave our home, leave our materialism, leave all the stuff that we usually define ourselves by, and we want to um, redefine that life is temporary and we're not defined by our stuff. Um, we specifically do it in the fall because we're showing Hashem appreciation, not when the weather is perfect in May, but when the weather is a little bit unpredictable in the fall. Um, it describes celebrating it. We also said it comes after Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. We're renewing that relationship with Hashem and then comes joy. The three themes of Sukkot so far we discussed is joy. We said there's a special biblical command, the Samachta Vechagecha Vahayita Achsameach, that you should be joyous with your holiday. You should celebrate. So it's, only, it's the only holiday that's actually described to have joy. Okay? How do we do We also said it, the theme is unity. To cover the theme of unity, we discussed how a sukkah has all sorts of qualifications, specifications, what materials you can use. Can you make it a triangle? Can you make it a, we showed, I showed them some pictures. There's a biblical park in Israel that has, the Mishnah describes over 50 different types of uh, sukkot, whether they're allowed or not allowed. And this biblical park actually makes those. Um, and I showed them that. I'm happy to send you a link later if you'd like, um, or you can just watch this clip. Okay. So we described that it's um, natural material on top uh, in walls that, that are flexible and not, um, not permanent walls, unless obviously you're using two walls of your house and then the third wall would be a temporary wall. We said also that as with all the specifications, with all the details of building a sukkah, the only one there's no limit to, the only area there's no limit to, it can be as big as you want it to be. And that's because one of the things of Sukkot is unity. We even described that on the time of Mashiach, the Talmud says, if call Yisrael Yeshua the sukkah, all of Israel will sit under one big sukkah, showing us the unity is a theme here. Now, we moved on to the four kinds. I just jumped back quickly to show them the sukkahs. I'm sorry, ladies. Hope I didn't confuse anyone. But I want to show them how cool it was that if you look at the word sukkah, it tells you how to build a sukkah, um, which kind of sukkah you build. Um, okay, so that being said, because I, I forgot that I have a, the, my kid, my 11 year old taught me how to use the whiteboard. You no, know? I'll take it. Yesterday I taught finance scholars and I had five in person and five online. And let me tell you, I know what these professors are going through. It was not simple, but I was able to use the whiteboard because my daughter taught me how. So always learning new things, especially for the kiddos. Um, okay, so now we're going into the four kinds. We said it's actually a separate mitzvah of Sukkot on this holiday of joy. Take these four kinds, um, uh, palm fronds, that's together, close palm frond, like the top of the palm tree when it's first growing before it opens up, a citron, a willow, and a myrtle. Daxim and Aravot, Ulav and Etrog. And we said specifically that all of them need to be there. If one is missing, you do not have a complete set. Okay? And it's a mitzvah to take them together and make a bracha. Like, meaning it's not just like a nice, cute custom, it's a mitzvah. So if it's a mitzvah, we're supposed to learn something from it. We're supposed to have a takeaway from it, right? It's supposed to help us connect with Hashem. It's supposed to help us connect with ourselves and why we're here in this world. But how does that help me connect with Hashem? How does that help me connect with myself? How does that help me connect with fellow man? These are all really valuable questions because it kind of seems like, what is this? So each of them have two, there's many, many, many ways to look at this, but we're gonna, we're gonna zoom in on two ways to look at it. So first of all, on a very literal level, each one represents a different part of the body. So here we go, a different part of the body. What does that mean? The lulav 
okay? The lulav is the green, tall, tall, skinny. I'm not doing this very well, ladies. Okay, tall, skinny, palm, closed palm. What does that represent? I'm actually, instead of doing this, I'm going to just pull up a photo of it. What does that represent? That represents our spine, our spine. The etrog, let me just do lulav and etrog. I just showed them, I showed you ladies this before. Okay, the lulav and etrog. The etrog represents the heart, okay? The, the heart. The hadassin represent, I'm just looking for like a large photo so we could see a large photo of it. Hopefully this is large enough, this is large enough. Okay, Jacob. By the way, Sharon, when we were searching, we discovered that if you wanna get, um, if you wanna get a, a little bit of an etrog, you can order one on Amazon. Funny story. Oh, wow. Yeah, when I clicked on it, you'll actually laugh because when I clicked on it, the ladies saw this, it was pretty funny. We found it that on Amazon, you can order it. And then I had a price notification that said that in a week from now, the price for this product will go down. Is that funny? Oh, gosh. It's funny. God bless 2020. I was like, that's so funny that that's the way it is. Okay. So look at the etrog. You see up on top of my screen. The etrog actually represents the heart. Okay. That represents our heart. The lula represents our spine. The Hadassim represent our eyes, shaped like little almonds, and the Arabo represents our lips. And actually in Hebrew school, I give the kids of four kinds, I give them a body, an outline of a body, and I say, where do you think these belong in the body? What do you think this represents in the body? And they, they'll, they'll work together, and I'll put either a big one on the wall, or, a big one, or they each have their own individual one, and they're able to figure out that this looks like most like the lips, this looks most like the heart, so this is the heart, represents the heart, the eyes, the lips, the spine and the heart. Why do they represent those? And this is, by the way, this is just um, to hold it together. This is dehydrated palm, palm branches to hold uh, palm leaf, palm mm -hmm. strips. Well, leaves, yeah. The leaves before it opens up that uh, they make these into little, like, uh, you know, Chinese finger traps, but for the little of an etrog. Um, I know that my kids always love because yes, he makes the little rings out of them. He knows how to make the rings out of them to hold the little of an etrog together because you don't want an artificial item holding it together. It's all about the natural or natural kinds that grow on the, you know, grow in nature. So you want to have the natural material holding it together. Um, so is it clear, hold on, I see my honey screen showing me I have savings. Is it clear how that represents heart, eyes, lips, and spine? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So what's this explanation that tells us? The explanation actually teaches us that when we connect with, when we're serving Hashem, you and I can use all parts of ourselves to serve Hashem, to fulfill our potential in this world. And I actually always challenge the Hebrew school kids. I said, how can you use your spine to serve Hashem? Now, a young child will know it helps them stand and walk. So say I could walk to help a friend. I could walk to show. Now, you and I know a spine represents more than that, right? We know the spine communicates everything from here, to our body. We know have a spine means stand up for something that's right, right? That's what the spine represents. The heart, we all know emotions, feelings, it also pumps blood to our whole body, certainly need it. How can I serve Hashem with my heart? How could I, remember the theme is joy and unity? How can I serve Hashem with more joy and unity? How can I unite with others with using my heart? My eyes, how can I see the good in others? How can I use my eyes to look at the door, to see someone else's pain? And my lips are the words that come out of my mouth. And we all know that every single one of those, our spine, our heart, our eyes, and our mouth can be used not for the best things, but we're stubborn in an argument and we won't give up and we're so stuck in our idea and our spine is so rigid and uptight that's not the best, mm -hmm. but it's a reminder. It's an exercise. When you take that little venetro, you hold it together and you move it, actually you move it from your heart and you move it right, left, forward, up and down, all directions where Hashem is everywhere. Remind myself in all areas of my life, 
Can I use my heart for the right thing? Can I use my eyes for the right thing? Can I use my mouth for the right thing? Can I use my spine for the right thing? And so that's a really practical takeaway. And if I know I can use my full self to bring more light into the world, to bring more joy to others, to bring more unity, guess what the result is? Joy. We feel joy when we're using what God gave us for good. Mm -hmm. This is a trick. We talk about this so often. We want our children to be happy. We want to be happy. What can I do for others? How can I use the gifts I have? Because we said, this is a Thanksgiving holiday. We're thanking mm -hmm. Hashem. How can I use all the stuff I have? My body for good. The other explanation that Hasidus defines is so fascinating. Kabul describes that it actually represents four different types of people. The lulav comes from a palm tree, which has beautiful fruit, but if you ever smell the lulav, it doesn't smell like anything. It's certainly not pleasant. Hadassim have incredible smell and don't eat a hadassim. They don't taste good. Okay, aravot, no smell, no taste. A, a willow tree, that's nice and beautiful, but don't eat it. And then come the citron, smells beautifully, tastes it's delicious. It's citrus. Chassidus explains that they represent four different types of people. Smell is something, is a, a good deed, good actions. Why? If you walk into the room and you carry a vanilla, you light a vanilla candle in your room, the smell, anyone who walks in can benefit from it. Ugh. We all know the opposite. When something smells not pleasant, Everyone experiences the lack of pleasantry. Okay? So that is things that I can do that others can benefit from. Taste represents intellect. Using my intellect, Torah scholarship, Torah knowledge. Why? If I understand the concept in Torah and it makes sense to me and it clicks and it resonates and I get it, that's great. Who benefits? Me. I can't benefit from what's in your mind unless you share it with me. Then sharing with it, me, that's a mitzvah. That's a good thing that's doing something. But a good Torah, a good thought, so it's an academic or someone who does good. And what the Torah is telling you is that the Lua represents someone who enjoys a lot of scholarship or is an academic or an intellect, but it's all them. The citron represents someone who exceeds or excels in action and in intellect. The, uh, the willow represents someone who's not particularly shining in either area. No smell, no taste. And the hadassim smell beautiful. Wonderful actions towards others. Not too bright. And what is Torah telling us? All four. Bring them together in union. All types. It takes all types, the academics and the people who are going to roll up their sleeves and do the mitzvahs. I have to say, I've said it before to people who are constantly giving towards Chabad to make everything happen. And they say, no, no, I'm just, you know, I'm just writing each other. I'm like, no, no, we couldn't do what we do. We couldn't do all those mitzvahs. We couldn't provide all those things without that. It's a partnership. This is teaching us about the partnership in life. And now every single one in Judaism, every single one is valuable and counts and bring something to the table. And that again is unity. When you and I could look at everyone we meet and see that they can bring something to the table and we could be united with them and we could look at them and be like, wow, thank you, this is what you bring to the table. I remember once having a conversation with an academic who did not understand what menial laborers did. It didn't mean anything to him. They weren't contributing to the sciences. It was as if they should not exist. And I was like, who's gonna take out your garbage? And the guy's like, oh, whatever, it's not a big, I'm like, no, it's not all about it. Every, the world has room for everyone. Judaism has room for everyone. Hashem created everyone. When we can live with that knowledge that whatever gifts Hashem gave me, maybe I excel in academics or kindness. Maybe I could, I, wherever I could excel, wherever I could shine, wherever I could be in light, if I could see that in myself and I can see that in others, it leads to unity and it leads to joy. And so that is the deeper level of understanding the Lulav and So when a Chabad chases you down and hands you a Lulav and says, make a bracha, they're not just giving you an opportunity to do a mitzvah. 
they're also understand that these are the layers of what we're doing when we observe this mitzvah. And specifically on Sukkot, where we're focusing on the gifts we have, where we're focusing on the fact that we're not just defined by our home and our cars, all the things that divide us. I live in this neighborhood, I live in that neighborhood, I have this kind of car, that kind of car. It's not what defines us. We're defined by who we are. And so to circle around to the beginning of the story, oh, I will say, it's a full week holiday. Um, we eat in the sukkah, it's a mitzvah to eat in the sukkah, we say a special bracha on eating in the sukkah. It's also a mitzvah that when you do, if I do a mitzvah of tefillah, of prayer, so my mind is involved, my eyes are involved, my lips are involved, maybe my lungs are involved, right? But not necessarily are my fingers involved, right? When I give tzedakah, so my wallet's involved, whatever's involved. A sukkah, when you enter a sukkah and you sit in it and you eat in it, your whole entire self is involved in the mitzvah. All of you. And it's a very special mitzvah. So we'll actually have time sharing. I told the ladies in the beginning, we'll have time if anyone wants to reserve a spot on the sukkah with their family. We'll have snacks for their family. Come in. If you want to have lunch there with your kids or, you know, whatever it is, let us know. We're going to be making the sukkah available to people outdoors, plenty big, and we're happy to have everyone enjoy sukkah. So is that there any place to buy a lulav and esro? Funny that you ask. <laughs> ask yes, he, Sarah. He, he should have. He should have won maybe that. He, like, maybe he should have won or two extras. I know his order came, but ask him. He'll know. Okay? Thank you. Isn't that, or off of Amazon, right? <laughs> well, literally. Next week, <laughs> right, I looked on Amazon, and there's two-day shipping, so it'll take three days. Yeah, it's a Friday Shabbos. Yeah, so interesting. We don't do the we don't use the Lulav and Esrog on Shabbos. So this year, the first time you'll use it is Sunday. Just keep that in mind. Oh, all right. Keep that in mind. But ask Yassi. I, 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 I remember. I'll ask him also. Okay. 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 Thank you. And we also shake it all around. So we want to remind ourselves that Hashem is never remember. It's it's about us and Hashem. It's about us and our fellow people. It's a really beautiful holiday. Happens to be not going to lie. It's one of my favorite holidays. Always was. Always has been. I just. It's something very special. It's something uplifting. There, it's a powerful holiday. Okay, so now just to circle around um, a little bit of um, just back to the beginning of the story, Sharon, I told them that there was a police officer who drove by Chabad and we waved, we waved, whatever, and he pulled in to make sure we we're okay. Then we said, no, we're fine, we're just saying hi. And then he pulled back around and he's like, can I ask a question? What's that thing? I'm like, oh, it's a sukkah. What? What is that about? So I said to him, actually, all Jewish tradition and ritual oh. is something that happens and has a practical, tangible message for us in 2020. So it's to commemorate the fact that the Jews, as they traveled for 40 years in uncertain terrain and uncertain journey, Hashem embraced them with the clouds of glory, protecting from the sun, from the scorpions, from the enemies, from the temperature. Think of a thick fog or a thick cloud. That's how Hashem protects the Jewish people. So we're thanking Hashem for it. We're also remembering that life is temporary and the things we have are not who we are. So we go specifically into a temporary dwelling for a week where we eat, where we hang out, where we read books, where we, we relax and we remind ourselves that what we're doing here is temporary. The third thing we do is we remember, the third theme is unity and joy. Because when we truly could see Hashem in our lives and how it gives us so much, and when we can see our fellow man, um, each as a contributing whole, part of a whole, and if one is missing, we're not complete, then we're leading to unity and it leads to deep joy. And when I told this to the man, he's like, wow, <laughs> this is so cool. I'm like, yep, those are the things of Sukkot. And I hope that everyone can approach Sukkot with a little bit more of an appreciation for what is a seemingly, I don't know, interesting, fun, maybe cute holiday, and realize there's so much to it. And I have to tell you, we scratched the surface. We just scratched the surface. But there's so much more, as there always is with Torah learning. There's so much more. Thank you, Manya. Thank you, ladies. Amazing. Thank you. <sighs> Imagine if we could look at everyone with that perspective and what they, how they come to the table and how they exactly they are and that we need, everyone is needed. Imagine if we went through life knowing that we are needed, the world needs us. Could we raise our children that way, that the world needs them. They're part of a whole. Remember that. Thank you. Especially Thank you. 